Okay, so my name is Ian Hall, I'm from Bizria. Um, the session for this afternoon's uh, talk is about ventilation strategies and the overheating risk. So I think two things first of all to say. Uh, number one, ventilation is not the total solution to overheating, it's simply part of a package that we should be thinking about when we're looking at how we deal with overheating risk in refurbishment and retrofit. Uh, and number two, my kind of theory, if you like, or my concern is that we have for the last well, 10 plus years and a bit more been very focused on trying to improve the tightness characteristics of the building stock, both existing buildings and new buildings, and we are obviously uh, insulating them to a much better standard, and as a consequence of that, we are now getting some evidence for some unintended consequences, both in terms of indoor air quality and in terms of seeing excessive heat and temperatures at different times. Uh, so we need to be perhaps a bit cleverer or think about a few other issues when we're thinking about our strategy. What I thought I'd try and cover in this session, and to be fair we might have to go quite quickly to get through it all, is to just take a quick look at what's going on in the background, what are the sort of issues that we are starting to collect evidence on, then start to think about actually how do we define overheating? Is it just a thermal comfort issue or is it a bit more than that? Is it also, thank you very much, um, when can we determine if a building has overheated or the people within the building, to be more specific, have overheated and when are they actually going through a process of being uh, overheating? Thank you. Uh, what factors influence overheating? And then to think about some of the strategies in terms of ventilation, natural ventilation strategies, mechanical ventilation strategies, and then try and finish up with a few conclusions and thoughts about where we're going. It's quite difficult to illustrate overheating in one way, so I thought, well, let's, let's have an ambulance. That's always a good way. Uh, not that I'm suggesting we're ambulance chasing. Uh, Climate Change Committee report a little while ago suggested UK buildings are vulnerable to overheating and that this is likely to get worse as temperatures increase. I think this morning, uh, one of our morning presentations through the, uh, what I always consider quite horrifying fact that there are something like 29,000 excess deaths during the winter period, uh, actually, there's a rather smaller number, but it's still quite shocking. We estimate somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 excess deaths occur during the summer period that is associated with heat waves and summertime uh, overheating. In fact, uh, the last heat wave in Paris, and I get slightly confused here whether it's 2003 or 2006. Uh, thank you. Um, French wine. Was it? Because of the heat. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I wonder why you knew that one, John. Yeah. <laughs> Wine, cheese, John. Yeah, OK. Um, there's about a, a, an estimated number of 15,000 excess deaths during that summer in Paris, in the Paris area. OK, so clearly, as our climate warms, and again, if you saw the IPCC report at the beginning of uh, last week that they came out with, uh, due to the claimed inactivity of governments to be able to start to have a real impact, they are now estimating a four degree rise in temperature rather than the two degree rise that some of the scenarios were based on. So we have uh, an increasing problem that we are facing. There are a number of publications that are starting to appear and that's always a sign that the anecdotal evidence is starting to cause a degree of anxiety when people like the NHBC Foundation, the Zero Carbon Hub and others start to put publications out. Um, the middle one, understanding overheating where to start, very good little guide produced by the Foundation and Richard Partington's architects and sets out very simply, whilst it may be more aimed at the new build sector, the concepts it's talking about and the ideas it illustrates are actually just as relevant in the existing building sector. If you want to look at or find some of the sources of the actual evidence and the reports that people have now started to prepare, the first document, Overheating in New Homes, a review of the evidence, is actually a very well written and balanced report and has some uh, excellent sources associated with it. Uh, the work by the Zero Carbon Hub, I nearly, I was very tempted to put up their actual other document they produced, which was called um, New Homes, Where to Start with Overheating. I thought, well, that's perhaps not the best title you could have had for it, guys, but there we are, never mind. How do we actually define overheating and what are the impacts associated with uh, overheating? Uh, the Home Health Safety Register System, wonderful thing, suggests as temperatures rise, thermal stress increases, initially triggering the body's defense mechanisms, such as sweating, High temperatures can increase cardiovascular strain and trauma, trauma, and where temperatures exceed 25 degrees C, mortality increases and there is an increase in strokes. 
dehydration is primarily a problem for the elderly and the very young. So that kind of definition, which goes out to people like environmental health officers, if you like, for them, sets the kind of criteria when they start to look at housing uh, as to what may be uh, a definition of overheating. There are kind of two bits of information I pick up from that. First of all, they've given a, a temperature there where the temperatures exceed 25 degrees C, okay? I know some of you folk have been involved with the kind of evaluation type programs, data collection type programs. One of the things that we consistently see, uh, particularly in bedrooms and living rooms, is temperatures that are pushing up to 25 degrees, actually if not 28, 30 degrees C on a fairly regular basis. You might be quite comfortable with a peak that occurs and then very quickly disappears. So you then have to start thinking about, well, if we're talking about a definition for overheating, do we have to think about a period of time that that temperature is exceeded and what might that period of time look like? Dehydration, a problem for the elderly and the very young, actually that classifies straight away for us some of the more vulnerable groups that we're dealing with and we have to think about them. So in the context of refurbishment of existing properties, actually what we need to start thinking about is who are the folk that are already in that building, if they're going to be going back into that building or we're going to do the refurbishment around them, what does that mean for them as a specific group? Now one of the kind of interesting things about a human animal is that actually we're very good at adapting to our thermal environment. That's part of the reason that we, uh, we can live almost anywhere from the edges of the polar regions down to the very hot desert areas and give us sufficient time and we will adapt. So actually it's part of the strategy here that we need to give ourselves time to be able to adapt to these conditions. Um, one of the great things about design, if you like, is in this instance, one of the parks, they can all go out, they can strip off a certain layer of clothing, they can drink plenty, and they can start to feel more comfortable with the environment. How do we come up with strategies and solutions in our houses that allow us that same level of control, if you like? What does SIBSI suggest to us in terms of definitions of overheating? This is actually from SIBSI's Guide A, Environmental Design. They did publish, uh, back end of last year actually, a technical memorandum on uh, overheating as well. Although actually I quite like to work with this one. In terms of living rooms, they suggest an operative air temperature of between 23 and 25 degrees C is acceptable, uh, but an absolute peak temperature of 28 degrees C. If you bear in mind that earlier definition, I said that 25 was the, where thermal trauma, if you like, starts to take place in the body. If you're going to be sitting at 28 in your living room for any period of time, that potentially uh, is going to be quite damaging for you. Bedrooms 23 to 25, again with a peak temperature of 26. But I think the really kind of interesting point is the sleep may be impaired above 24 degrees C. Um, there was a Dutch study, which I referred to yesterday actually in one of the sessions, where they looked at 300 houses and they asked the people uh, to sort of self-diagnose, if you like, what were the issues, what were the health issues that they were seeing. And what actually came back from that, the, the sort of number one biggest problem that people were coming back about, is if they had an impaired night's sleep, they didn't get a good night's sleep, they didn't feel rested overnight, that that was what they determined as being the biggest impact on their well-being. Now actually, in terms of that study, they were largely talking about noise from either central mechanical extract or mechanical ventilation with heat recovery type systems, Whereas in this instance, obviously, we're talking about heat and the build-up of heat causing those problems. But we can use that as a reasonable starting point for our uh, definitions, if you like, for trying to uh, ensure that we can achieve some comfortable conditions. Just out of curiosity, uh, ventilation rate there that is specified is really all about controlling moisture. It's about the sort of thing that Part F was originally starting to control. It suggests a ventilation rate between 0.4 and 1 air change per hour. Um, sat in on a different session a little while ago where they've been looking specifically at overheating issues in some small single aspect flats uh, and the lady giving the presentation stood up and said yes we've calculated to make it comfortable in these small flats we need an air change rate of 12 air changes every hour and we're thinking of trying to find a fan to do it. <laughs> it's kind of like, you haven't thought that one through, have you? Uh, think about the size of the fan that you might need to give you 12 air changes per hour in that space. You're going to have a few other problems as well, guys, if you're going to go down that route. Um, six air changes, I've heard that spoken about on a number of occasions. But realistically, you're not going to achieve that in a dwelling with a fan-based system. <coughs> Do we get to see evidence of overheating? Well, yeah, this is... Uh, one of my favorite uh, group of four houses. Uh, this is actually from one of the building performance evaluation projects that's still running at the moment. This is data from June uh, last year. 
couple of things about these houses. First of all, it's a terrace of four, okay? So you're looking at the two end terrace. This is an end terrace house. This is an end terrace. These are the two mid terrace houses. Uh, construction's exactly the same. They're all broadly about 90 to 95 square meters in floor area. And they all have what I would call a pretty standard typical family occupancy. They've got two adults and two children in them. So great, you know, we standardize some of the issues that normally give us difficulty when we're starting to look at the data. The other thing about these houses is they all have MVHR systems in. Um, now, to be fair, they've had their fair share of problems with their MVHR systems, both in terms of the original commissioning process and getting them commissioned uh, to operate something like the design. Um, and then you have the human element, what we do with it. So these folk are actually quite good. They use their MVHR system, they leave it alone, and they're pretty comfortable with it. They don't have too much uh, strain. These folk, they don't like it at all. They just turned it off, literally at the isolator switch, and they won't turn it back on. No matter how many times the Housing Association has been back, spoken to them about the issues, and these are the benefits, not touching it, don't like it, not using it. So it's just sat there dormant. So straight away, you've got a nice interesting comparison between two houses that are exactly the same. These folk are using their MVHR, these folk aren't using their MVHR. These folk, now these folk are really interesting. They like the MVHR during the day, but they don't like it during the night. So they turn it off at night. So it runs during the day, off at night, runs during the day, off at night. So that's really kind of interesting as well. It's an intermittent use. These folk have had one hell of a problem with the MVHR system. They cannot, in fact, this has now burnt out two fans on the extract side. Um, their filters have clogged on numerous occasions. I just don't quite understand. It's a, it's a sort of market town this, 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 uh, these houses are built in. So there's not really a kind of huge sort of urban dust environment or anything like that going on. So they're having some real issues about the operation of their system. So they kind of use it when they can, but the system itself doesn't always play ball for them. A couple of things strike me about this. Obviously, the blue line here is what's going on with the big outside world. All you're looking at is an air temperature measurement in these spaces. So bedrooms here sitting anything up to about 25 degrees, but probably if you drew an average line through there, probably sitting somewhere around about 23 degrees C, that's with the MVHR running normally. These folk, their bedrooms, actually they're dropping really right down low, then they're coming back up again, dropping right down. What this suggests to me is that these folk actually make far more use of their windows and are probably having a slightly beneficial effect as a, fact, uh, as a consequence of that, as against these people who are actually leaving the house pretty well shut up and letting the MVHR run. You can see again that you get some quite big spikes in temperature. Certainly here and here, you're pushing up to that sort of maximum peak temperature of 28 degrees. That said, it is just a simple spike and then it starts to pull down again quite quickly, which again, the occupants are actually opening their patio doors, that kind of thing, and allowing the dwelling to cool down quite rapidly. These folk are quite interesting in that their bedroom runs a lot hotter, generally speaking, than the actual living room. So kind of if I had a, a real kind of concern area, it's these people, because they intermittently use the MVHR system, and actually their bedrooms are getting to be warmer than the living rooms and the rest of the spaces. So the actual space they're spending quite a lot of time in overnight is actually getting up and certainly kind of hitting into an average of about 24 degrees C. And that's just four houses. Ooh. Um, out of curiosity with their MVHR systems, uh, there are temperature probes, uh, to be fair, I don't know exactly where the temperature probes are located in their supply and extract ducts, uh, but what you can see here in these folk is there's really no difference between their supply and their extract duct. I have to say I'm slightly worried as to exactly where those sensors are located. Um, there's a bit of a difference here, uh, and again, this is all over the place, but bearing in mind these folk are not using the system. So. Yes, we can start to collect data. Actually understanding the context and what that data is telling us uh, is proving problematic. So what factors influence overheating? Well, clearly external climate. And in truth, uh, there is a perception that the overheating issue, certainly in the next few years, is more of a sort of south of the country issue, not a north of the country kind of issue. And there's lots of work been done on looking at the heat island effect, certainly in London and other big cities, to see what sort of impact that has on the temperatures that we might actually be using for the air to ventilate the properties themselves. Clearly, location of the property is going to be an issue, uh, as indeed whenever we consider uh, location-based factors for any property, if it's uh, on an exposed location, can be cooled quite effectively by the uh, prevailing wind, then that's going to be beneficial. It's built form. 
quite a lot of the research that's been done to date has identified that there are certain types of built form that are more prone to overheating. No surprises for thinking purpose-built flats, particularly single aspect flats, have a problem. Actually, what surprised me when I started reading some of those reports is that 1960s end of terrace type dwellings also seem to be particularly prone to overheating. Now, maybe that's a sort of function of the open sort of plan designs. Maybe it's a function of the fact that they tended to go for larger glazed areas or a kind of combination of masonry and sort of lightweight frame constructions on the front and back wall. But clearly, within the data sets that we have at the moment, those kind of two types of properties are being flagged as being the most kind of vulnerable types of property uh, and perhaps not surprisingly as well, any modern property and by that they're defining it as post-1990 construction, so really from the sort of mid-80s when the building rigs started to step the U values up and improve on those kind of characteristics are particularly prone to overheating as well. So again, when you're looking at your refurbishments and thinking about it, does it drop into one of those categories? Is it going to be a higher risk property in the first place? Orientation, clearly no surprises about that, which way the uh, primary uh, elevations are orientated and which way the glazing is facing is going to be part of the factor. Building fabric characteristics, much of the data that's been collected so far and many of the studies, particularly in the sort of medical world, have all linked their data to external temperature and what's going on with the external temperature. And there's a kind of presumption that what's happening with the external temperature is mirrored by what's going on in the internal data set temperature. We don't actually know that for sure, and clearly uh, the, the characteristics of the wall constructions is going to influence what's happening with the internal temperature. We are clearly getting more data, as you've seen to, by some of the slides today, through programs like the TSB's Building Performance Evaluation data. But I would say at the moment, the focus for all the kind of meta-analysis and everything that's going on with that is obviously about the carbon reduction agenda and the energy reduction uh, issues. It's not about what's going on in terms of overheating. That said, we've got the data. I'm sure we can start to do those sorts of studies. Room type, again, based on some of the work uh, from France and looking at the um, issues that they experienced with the overheating and the uh, uh, heat wave in Paris, room type is quite, uh, quite a key issue uh, when you look at what's happening in thermal stress and bedrooms are the key room because of the time that we are spending in bedrooms uh, and the uh, impacts of overnight uh, increases in temperature. Again, time of day from those studies is being flagged up as one of the influencing factors. Perhaps the one that we have relatively little control over when we're doing retrofits is occupant behaviour. Clearly we can talk to people about a whole range of things, but as we've heard from different studies over the last day and a half, and the one I was sat in just before lunch about controls, actually trying to positively uh, get the sort of outcome that you want comes down to the simplicity of the interface and all those kind of messages. So when it comes down to overheating, I think we've got quite a difficult job on our hands to get people to change their lifestyles. Ventilation. Yep, ventilation is a... We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, what, are, what are the sources of heat that we're dealing with within overheating? Well, clearly us and our activities are one of the primary sources. Domestic hot water systems, poorly insulated primary pipe work, you know, domestic hot water cylinders, stored hot water sitting there, all the various electrical appliances that we now have filling up our homes, they are sources of heat. External sources of heat, no surprises, solar gains through the windows, solar gains through the building fabric, the higher temperatures associated with the urban heat island effect, although I have to say, having read one or two of those studies, I think the agenda's a bit confused there at the moment. What I kind of term building boundary conditions, all I simply mean by that is if you've had the sun beating on a wall for a long uh, period during the day, that's then re-radiating that heat back out at night. If the supply air, temp uh, the supply air to your uh, MVHR system is sitting right alongside that nice hot wall, is it surprising that you're dragging hot air into the building? Uh, within the NHPC guidance, they try to produce a nice little image uh, about what sort of happens where you get these uh, effects. So you've got solar gains, you've got the MVHR system because that seems to be the default position that people go to. Oh look, we want uh, ventilation, we'll have MVHR. But clearly you have sources of noise which will stop people opening their windows. You also have people's concerns about security effects. <laughs> and one of the bizarre little facts I discovered is the number of people who fall out of windows or are concerned about their young children falling out of windows and then they obviously restrict the amount that they can actually open windows by. So they're all kind of the agenda, if you like, that we're dealing with. So in terms of design questions, uh, 
First of all, if it's a retrofit, is overheating already occurring in that building? Does that building already overheat? So are you potentially going to make it worse with your retrofitting or your refurbishment of that dwelling and make that risk or increase that risk? So you've got to ask yourself those questions. The challenge, particularly for designers, is you know, all of our designs are based on historic data and actually what we need to be looking at is the future impacts of climate change and what that means to our designs. Let's get on to ventilation and how we use ventilation. Um, generally speaking, most of us are fairly used to the idea of uh, sort of purge ventilation and opening the windows to achieve that purge ventilation. So either it's a sort of single-sided ventilation approach, we need to have openings at a low level and at a high level, which will allow air uh, in and out of that space, or uh, as many of the studies that BRE carried out in the mid-80s and onwards with their various test houses, if we can achieve a cross-ventilation situation, then we are going to see uh, a much better performance. But how do we actually set about creating those sort of conditions? Well, clearly uh, a fair bit of it's about the windows we choose, how those windows open, how easy we can make that for people to actually uh, open their windows. There are a number of factors that influence the choice of the window that you make within a project. Cost is obviously going to be a primary one of those. Um, if I was looking at it solely from the point of view of ventilation, obviously what I'm really interested in is how wide a gap can I achieve here to make sure that I can get a decent flow of air going through that particular property. Um, Sat makes some interesting uh, assumptions about what we can or can't do, uh, but again, then you run into the occupant behavior issue. I personally quite like these kind of windows, although actually it was pointed out to me, of course, you know, if it's raining, as it does quite a lot in our part of the world, then potentially you're just going to let water straight in through that window, although most of us shut our windows when it's raining, don't we? I'm not sure. Kind of the other thing that worries me about some of the solutions that get offered is, yes, we do have concerns about security, and one of the sorts of responses that people make to that sometimes is, well, look, we'll put some bars on the outside of it. This is actually a sheltered accommodation uh, building. It's like, would you want to be an occupant of that building? You're now feeling like you've been uh, uh, caged up like an animal. Okay, they put some uh, little handles here so you can open the thing, but judging by the amount of greenery growing up here, I don't think anyone's opened that cage for a long time. So, not a particularly attractive solution, I have to say. Uh, kind of not the subject I'm talking about today, but interesting kind of concept as to what they're going on and sort of thermal bridging that might be occurring with those kind of types of lintels. This was one of the projects that was funded through Retrofit for the Future. Uh, it did actually get quickly flashed up, I think, in one of the presentations uh, yesterday. I can't remember, honestly, which one. There are, in essence, two components to their ventilation strategy in this particular dwelling. Uh, using these grills as a way of introducing supply air into the building that you can open up uh, the louvers and you can get uh, still a secure flow of air coming in. You can just about see it up on the roof. Uh, there is a sort of uh, opening skylight kind of arrangement that allows air to be drawn through the property. All of which I think is quite effective, quite reasonable. If you keep this down to as of about 300 mil width, you're going to get um, a fairly standard sort of mullion arrangement. They're quite easy to open and reasonable to secure. A question got asked yesterday, what about your building's insurance? Did the insurance feel kind of comfortable with this? Uh, I, suppose, I couldn't remember from my own personal building's insurance. Uh, I know when, you, when you're doing the go compare or whatever for your car, it asks you, have you modified your car in any particular way, which most of us say, no, we haven't. I don't think it asks the same question in building contents insurance type thing, but clearly uh, there is potential for them perhaps to take a, a kind of dim view of that sort of thing because they might feel it's less secure. Hopefully not, because I wouldn't want to see that sort of thing being uh, uh, an influence on whether we use these kind of systems. I think from a more practical point of view, uh, it's quite interesting that this, these, these folk obviously keep their, uh, their window sills nice and clear. Certainly in my house, uh, there's all sorts of pot plants and pictures and all sorts of wonderful uh, accumulated debris on the, uh, uh, on the window sill. So uh, kind of being encouraged to open it may be uh, something of a, an occupant behavioral type issue. But I think it's a reasonable uh, approach and uh, an effective solution, I'm told, by the people who are monitoring the dwelling as well. Um, I did wonder if it was just one of those wonderful serendipity moments because they managed to get the bus going past as they took the photograph, which is like, hey, well done, folks. No, I don't think you took that one. It's not one of yours, no. Um, 
This is Hannam Hall. This is actually a new development being done by uh, Barrett's. However, it was the only place that I could find a nice illustration of what they're doing here with these sliding uh, louvers and shutters that they've been using. This, um, this particular terrace has been occupied for a reasonable period of time. The rest of the development is going on behind us. Um, chatting to the site manager and the guys on site, they are uh, quite surprised at how quickly people have adapted and now actually use these shutters. They see almost on a daily basis that people use the shutters. If they're going off to work, they're sliding them across so that they allow the house not to heat up too much during the day and they're sliding them back again in the evening. Uh, these houses are all being, well, there's 10 of them are being quite extensively monitored uh, by us. Part of that monitoring is actually uh, monitoring the usage of these shutters when people use them, when they don't use them. So it should be interesting. Give us another kind of, I don't know, six, eight months down the line when we've got a bit more data to actually look at how successful uh, as a design technique that is. Certainly in having a quick chat with uh, one of the householders before they dashed off, um, they, they like them. They like the aesthetics of the design and they find it very effective. So. Are they secure? Yeah, because they're just, uh, effectively, the window is sitting behind it. So that's all on the outside of the building. You can just slide it across. If you open your window? Uh, the window's open inwards. In this particular yeah. instance, you can see that one tilts back sure. in. But yeah, I mean, potentially, yes, if you throw the window open. Slide them back. Yeah, they're very. They need to be locked yeah. as well, don't they? Well, so maybe. Maybe. So you can have secure nighttime ventilation. Yes, yeah, fair point. Yeah, yeah, no, very good job. Yeah, fair point. You wouldn't want to go, if, it, if somebody could just walk up and slide them open. You they aren't. Them. Certainly these ones on these windows are not lockable. They just slide straight with the forwards, backwards and forwards. The ones on the patio doors actually are lockable, because I remember we were having some issues about where we were putting the sensors for looking at it to keep them out of their locking mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is an interesting question. I should now go and ask them on what basis they made the decision that these aren't lockable, but those are maybe to do with the, um, the rooms and the opening areas. Um, just before we leave sort of natural ventilation, uh, I was asked yesterday about the passive stack in particular, the, the Ventive type system out there and whether, whether we believe it works. Um, I have to say, whilst I'm sort of reasonably comfortable with passive stack as a type of system, I don't have a particular problem with it. Uh, when you start looking at the data and posing a few questions, particularly about the standards of air tightness of the dwellings and the quantity and the volume of air movement you might want, it looks difficult to me to see how a passive stack system is going to give you sufficient flows of air to actually now enable you to purge, ventilate. I'm sure there'll be times where it will be some, of some benefit, uh, but I don't think it would be a system on its own that I would rely on. Mechanical ventilation type systems then, well, in essence, what we're talking about here is a quick lift from approved document F, our continuous mechanical extract type systems or supply and extract systems with heat recovery. It always amuses me slightly that the documentation in part F shows you with the box in the loft, which I know where it ends up an awful lot of time, but in truth, you know, if you follow best practice, that should be part of the insulated space. I guess they might argue that they put the insulation in the rafters, but I suspect they haven't. Side. Absolutely, it's, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of issues, but we won't, we won't pull them apart for that uh, at this precise moment in time. When we look at, uh, I think it's one of your slides, isn't it, John? It's yeah. John Broom's slide. It's, yeah. Um, when we look at the issues associated with MDHR, uh, there is a kind of whole growing catalogue uh, of issues that are being flagged through things like the BPE program and through the retrofit for the future type programs. Um, to be fair to the people who do know how to do MVHR, it is a system that can be well designed and can be put in and can work. Uh, however, by the way we tend to procure these things, uh, it, there, are, there is a lot of opportunity along the line for it to go wrong or be derailed. Just a couple of quick uh, pointers really. Obviously the heat exchanger should be inside the insulated envelope. There are challenges in small dwellings, particularly if uh, we're looking at a warm loft space. Again, that can often bring you into conflict with the noise issue. Uh, if it has a summer bypass, we often see it getting used all the year round or it's being uh, bypassing the MVHR uh, heat recovery element. Ducting should be run inside the insulated envelope. In an ideal world, larger the bore, nice smooth bore, nice swept bends, the air is going to flow and move around the system a lot better. If you can come up with a ducting arrangement that allows one duct per room, then that is going to work for you better in our experience. 
the whole challenge with these types of systems and existing dwellings is how you find the route between A and B. A few pleas, really, I guess, from my point of view, in terms of installation. Uh, one of the first challenges we face when we're looking at uh, evaluating buildings and what's been going on is actually, is there a documented design? Very often, if there is a documented design, it can be quite challenging to find that documented design, or that there may be an initial starting point, and then perhaps through the procurement process that's gone on to the supplier, and they've come up with a different design, and the whole design intent starts to fall apart. So. Uh, let's have some documented designs, please. It needs to be considered as part of the retrofit. It's not a kind of bolt-in measure all on its own. Uh, and if you can find them, there are experienced fitters out there. I think one of the issues for the industry, generally speaking, is allowing these people to actually have some sort of accreditation, if you like, some sort of badge that says, yes, I do know what I'm doing. I have done it and successfully done it on a number of occasions. Perhaps I would say this coming from Bizria these days, Commissioning is a major problem. Um, there is a whole raft of issues around the different types of device that people use to measure air flows through these systems. Uh, actually, if they actually understand, I think, the measurements they're making, what they're then comparing them to, particularly if they don't have the design information, um, and it's not unusual to be handed a commissioning sheet with a set of data that's only to one decimal place, and they're all the same values. Thinking, well, that can't really be right, can it, guys? There's been lots of conversations around uh, replacement of filters and ease of access for maintenance and making sure that maintenance gets done so that uh, you maintain the effectiveness of the system. Uh, I would add to that as well, there are some issues that are being raised and questions posed about how effectively you can clean the ductwork, particularly with the old flexible ducting type systems and whether that's bringing some further problems down the line. Um, appreciate all of this is a, perhaps a bit of a step away from overheating, but whatever ventilation system we are installing or strategy we are following, we have to make sure it works properly. Again, another great joy of uh, joining the wonderful world of Bizria is you suddenly discover there's a, something of a, a sort of a shocking library of photos of how not to rather than ones of how to. Um, everything from the, how did he make this hole? Someone suggested yesterday he, he made it with his head. <laughs> I've met a few pretty big blokes on site, but I don't want to meet the bloke that made that hole with his head, um, to be honest. Kind of the issues that this flags up is, yeah, if we are going to be jointing duct work, uh, a bit of flimsy tape, if it held for about two minutes, that would be good, but that's never going to be a proper robust solution. Um, likewise, you know, they've obviously used some electrical tape to uh, tape that particular ducting on, but it's not very well supported and give it 18 months and it'll have fallen back down. This is just a nicely misaligned duct, so quite how they expect the flow of air to go through that, and it's obviously being compressed as well. And this, sometimes when you look at the way they arrange the ductwork above the MVHR units, you have to applaud the guys that managed to get it in on site, but clearly that's not going to be an effective way of moving air through those systems. Uh, installing flexible ductwork, uh, realistically, it should only really be used to make the final connections to ventilation units, grills, diffusers, that kind of thing. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of handy, interesting little tip if you're uh, doing some walkthroughs on buildings. If you want to know how well the, uh, the ductwork's been installed, if you grab hold of it, if you can, in a certain place and just sort of scrunch it, if it doesn't move, there's a reasonable chance they've actually pulled it out to this sort of 90% of its maximum length, but I guarantee probably nine times out of ten it'll just all scrunch up nice and easily for you. Should be adequately supported so it doesn't collapse. Try and install it where it won't be damaged, that's always handy. Uh, connection shouldn't just be taped. Uh, and make sure, if you want the air to come all the way through the system, that you maintain the integrity of the ductwork. If you have nice big gaps, clearly your air isn't going to get where you want it to go. Uh, it's Bizria's publication that tells you all about how to measure airflow rates through systems, and uh, that's one of the pieces of kit that allows you to do it uh, with reasonable accuracy. Here's a kind of interesting idea, prompted quite a lot of debate yesterday afternoon in the session that I ran. Um, okay, this is a fairly large house and there's not too many houses that have got a plant room of this size uh, that happens to be a sort of sub-basement below the rest of the house. Um, however, uh, the approach they've taken is to try and temper the incoming air using this uh, earth duct system. 
Um, no prizes for guessing they've had a few difficulties, uh, not least that the sump that is just here has filled up with water on several occasions, uh, not least because of the quality of some of the joints, but just because the, uh, we've had one of the wettest summers, uh, winters, sorry, uh, going. It's a wrong season, Ian. Um, one of the questions yesterday was about how much benefit has that system shown? Well, based on some of the data, and it's early days to be honest, we are typically seeing somewhere between six to eight degrees uh, <coughs> difference between the absolute outside air and the supply air coming into the MVHR system. So it is potentially being beneficial in that way. One of the questions, uh, and I don't know, John, you might be able to answer this one better than me, is um, have we seen any signs of bacterial growth within this ductwork and is that causing any problems? I, I haven't experienced anything on, in that sense yet, but it is only fairly early days on the system. Have you had any kind of experience of that? No, that is one of the issues, particularly if it collects water. Mm. Yes, which this one has done quite effectively. Yes. It. Tilting down to a drain. Yeah. But um, it's, it to me would not be a system that you can always install. It is obviously going to be rather building uh, dependent, but uh, I certainly think it has some merit and could be beneficial. Uh, that's just my reminder slide really to tell me um, that the controls that we put into these things and whilst I actually quite enjoyed the Honeywell presentation before lunch, you know, I still think there is a, a big gulf between people's understanding even of some of these symbols and what they actually mean uh, and what happens with the system if they flick that particular symbol. You know, do they get some sort of response from this control to tell them that the system is now doing something different? Yeah. Well, it's, it's just a reminder slide. Um, you know, and what does this mean? Is, does, this, does this change the volume of the fan, or is this, this about the... Uh, yeah, it's more noise, less noise. Oh, yeah. um, so it's, this is clearly... Um, well, I'm presuming... Sorry, this one. This, <laughs> careful here. Presuming this one is summer-winter mode. You know, this is a nice little sort of frost stat, and this is a, a nice little thing. Um, but I'm not quite sure what this one's doing. What's, what does that symbol mean? I'm not quite sure. So anyway, uh, the point about this is control systems, if we can make them a little bit more intuitive, that would be great. Uh, if we can actually put them in places that people can access and use them, that would be even better, rather than hiding them at the back of the, uh, the airing cupboard or even up in the loft. Um, and I still think we have something of a long journey to go on in that uh, direction. So a few of the findings from Retrofit for the Future, from all the various uh, post-occupancy evaluation, 360 degrees. Uh, the biggest, vent uh, biggest issue that's screened out from that is that ventilation is identified as the weakest element. Poor strategies, poor design, poor installation, poor commissioning, poor operation. We'll all go home now. We clearly can't do it, can we? Uh, apart from that, we're wonderfully. Yeah. Apart from that, it's all fine. Any ventilation manufacturers in the room? No, OK. <laughs> Um, in terms of design approach, many projects simply defaulted to MVHR, and that's clearly being driven by their uh, claim performance through SAP and people going after a particular CO2 target rather than standing back and remembering. First and foremost, ventilation is about indoor air quality and actually giving you uh, a fresh indoor environment. And it's one of Peter Rickaby's favorite points. MVHR was really developed for new low energy dwellings it does have some specific issues about trying to adapt it within retrofit projects. It's not uh, as straightforward as at first one might hope or perceive. That also brings the issue of air permeability. What standard of air permeability are you going for within your ventilation strategy? And then in terms of summertime, what's actually going to be the unintended consequence of having a very high air permeability? Clearly, we need to ensure that we get the balance correct. And at the moment, I would suggest we still have some way to go in terms of deciding what is the appropriate level. I was slightly amused in yesterday afternoon's debate around uh, the Dragon's Den came the issue of what, what standard of air tightness do you need for an MVHR system? You know, is it passive house better than one or is it somewhere around this, this, this level of three which um, uh, has unknown um, provenance, shall we say, as to where that came from. People are confused about what makeup fresh air should be coming from. Should they be fitting uh, trickle ventilators? Do they open windows? Don't they open windows? Well, I showed you the data earlier from those four houses. People are clearly getting very mixed messages, but ultimately, uh, occupant behavior, we can't kind of try and design out occupants. We have to work with them and understand what their issues are. 
putting heat exchangers in unheated spaces is clearly not a very clever thing to do. You're just going to get uh, problems there. Likewise, spiral bound ductwork with too many bends just taken on a very torturous route. No summer bypass, clearly given that we are talking about uh, overheating, then I would suggest to you that we need to incorporate summer bypasses in all of these uh, uh, systems, but that brings with it uh, further complications. Poor commissioning and handover, I think that just runs throughout the whole of the, uh, the piece for ventilation systems. We still uh, see them really as occupants that we, uh, not occupants, of components that we procure rather than systems that we install. Poor maintenance, uh, again, it's a running theme about people not being able to access filters or even if they can get to the filters, discovering that they built shelves in front of them or that it opens into the cupboard door, all sorts of weird and wonderful things that people do. Uh, and simply people switch it off because they get fed up with it, they can't engage with the process and then you don't have a ventilation strategy anymore because people have turned the system off. So, a few thoughts to conclude and then have a, a general conversation and discussion around some of the issues. Uh, we have an ageing population and one of the things that the uh, studies have highlighted is that the elderly in particular are vulnerable to overheating and we need to take that into account and think about it. Um, We need a better definition of overheating and we need some clearer guidance on what are acceptable threshold temperatures. Are we talking about uh, 25 as a threshold, as I suggested to you earlier, or are we looking at SIBSI's guidance, which seems to suggest anywhere between 24 and 28 might be an acceptable threshold. And clearly it comes back to this conversation around what length of time are you going to exceed those temperatures for? How can people adapt to the temperature that they are finding themselves in? We need a much greater understanding about how the dwellings and their construction modify the impacts of overheating. Again, you know, I'm coming from Bizria, we're a research organisation, maybe I would be making the case for doing more research. <coughs> much of the data that we have out there at this precise moment in time is actually based on modelling exercises. It's not based on real data, it's based on a number of presumptions that are made. In terms of retrofit directly, I think uh, perhaps not surprisingly, all the focus has been on uh, reducing space heating demand, trying to make the dwelling more energy efficient in that sense. I think actually we have to now broaden our horizons and our perspective and start to evaluate them in terms of overheating risk as well. We need to consider all the sources of heat gain, not just think about solar ones. There are other sources of heat gain and make sure that we uh, work with people to reduce uh, those heat gains where they are occupant related. We can't design out occupant behaviour, they do need to be part of the solution, we need to find better ways of engaging with them. And at the end of the day, ventilation is part, but not all, of the solution. You need to bear in mind things like thermal mass and people's behaviour as well. That's really uh, what I wanted to say this afternoon from, uh, from my point of view in terms of making a presentation.